church family. It is so good to see you all. Please stand to your feet and worship with us this morning.
Every tongue will confess. Sing, who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord?
Do you know how easy it is to preach after worship like these guys do for us each and every week? It's so much fun. And I hate to tell you, I don't get to preach today. And I really am ready. Thank you for being here. If this is your first time here, we're so glad that you've joined and become part of the Avenue Church today. If you do want more information, at both campuses, we have a hub in the back. And you can go out there and you can get on the QR code or, a QR code or ask questions. And we're just glad to have you here. We have a gift for you. If you want to come and just be anonymous and sneak out of the building afterwards, that's okay too. We want you just to come and see, and you can do that, and uh, we're just glad that you're part of it. We're about to pass these buckets, and, and I know that's kind of a strange thing, but many people, part of their worship is to literally physically give money as, this, as these buckets pass. Me personally, I write a check, and it's the first check I write each time I get paid, and that's my act of worship. And so just kind of hang with us as we go through that act of worship. Uh, if you're a guest, we're not asking you for money. We're just glad that you're here, like I said. Today, we have a special guest. In May, I went to Minnesota and spent five days fishing on the Lake of the Woods Lake. And uh, some of you are like, man, that is so exciting. Not for me. I don't go fishing. I fish at Long John Silver's. I've caught something every time I've been there. But I did go to meet a man that I'd heard about at noon named Dr. Wes Stafford. Dr. Wes Stafford has been part of Compassion International for 45 years. Compassion International is a place that we started partnering with nine years ago to help meet needs all over the world. And he just shared with me back in 45 years ago, they had 25,000 kids that they served around the world. Today, they have 2.2 million children. And so with that, you're part of it. The Avenue has sponsored over 1,000 kids throughout the last nine years. And we are actively sponsoring 300 kids uh, right now. And we want to give you an opportunity to be part of this incredible, incredible ministry. I wanted to meet the man that had passion and vision to make such a huge difference in the world. And I did not... I was not disappointed. I wanted him to come and share with you. And so let's welcome Dr. Wes Stafford.
Good morning, the Avenue Church. What a joy to be with you. Yes, we had a wonderful fishing trip. Uh, the conversation only interrupted by fish every once in a while. Other than that, it was a great, great trip. I'm really glad to see you today uh, because the way Pastor David was talking about you, I was a little worried that when I got here, you would all be 10 feet tall, that you would be able to leap buildings in a single bound. And I'm like, I'm so relieved that you're, you're normal like me. This is, this is great. But he loves you guys. Don't you, don't you love this man? 32 years he's been shepherding this place. I've, uh, I've come to, uh, to, to really, really love him. We got to spend at least one of those five days, just us, in a, bu- in, in a boat where we could just talk and share our hearts. I fell in love with your pastor. I love his heart. I love his courage. I love his vision. I love the heritage that brought him here 32 years ago, and now to see how you're thriving here. One of the things I've observed about you that warms my heart is you absolutely believe in children in this church, and I can see it all around you. Your campus is set up for children. Any child who is a part of this church is a blessed uh, little child, and um, I love that because uh, I can see from the number of sponsorships that you do. Do you realize that a thousand would fill every seat in this place? Can you imagine if all of your sponsored children were gathered together in here? I wouldn't want to organize that event, mind you, uh, but it would take every seat in this uh, in this place. And so, thank you for letting God use you so powerfully across the world and uh, and right here. So this. Sunday as I'm gathered with you, I feel, I feel right at home. You have to understand that usually when I'm speaking, I'm speaking to somewhat of a hostile crowd. It's usually a bunch of missiologists or seminary professors or mission executives, and I can always tell that they don't know when they walked in what we were going to talk about. I can tell by their body language. They're like, we're going to talk about what? Children? Really? I don't have to worry about that here. With them, I use statistics and strategy and scripture to try to make the case. Uh, But I know your heart's here. And so this feels like vacation to me. Uh, I don't have to convince you. uh, But what I do want to do is encourage you in what you're doing in the lives of children around you. And maybe arm you to join me in the battle for the little ones of of the kingdom. So the message, if there was a message, would be something like, the least of these matter most. And what's interesting is for the 2,000 years of the church, the church has behaved with its priorities and its budgets and its strategies as though in Matthew 25, Jesus, that great teacher, inadvertently skipped the word when he said, whatever you've done for one of the least of these, you've done it to me. We've behaved as if what he meant to say is whatever you've done for one of the least important of these. But he didn't. He knew exactly what he was saying. When he said the least of these, he meant the poor. He meant the marginalized. He meant the vulnerable. Surely he meant the youngest and smallest among us. He surely meant when you do it for one of these who can't speak for themselves, one of these who can't protect themselves, one of these who can't care for themselves, one of these that is least able to thank you, to honor you, to reward you, then mysteriously and wonderfully the Lord says, that was me that you did that for. Which means, teacher, that little boy that you just won't give up on, Jesus would say, that was me. Officer, that little girl that you protected, Jesus would say, that was me. That long overdue hug I felt those tears you brushed from that little cheek. Those were my tears. That little child you sponsored all the way over in Guatemala, Honduras, that was mysteriously and wonderfully me. That Matthew 25, verse 40, judgment day, is in fact coming. It's only one trumpet blast away from now when the dark glass is going to be removed and the curtain pulled aside, and we are all going to understand the priorities of the kingdom of God. There's going to be so many surprises in that day. Who we thought was important isn't going to be all that important. And what we thought was important isn't going to be all that important. We're going to learn in that day that the little were in fact big 
in the upside down kingdom. And that those of you who blessed them touched the very heart of God. So as we start talking about children, let me, let me uh, give you a little pretest. Make sure that we're all on the same page here as I think we are. Uh, so listen to this story. And um, no paper, no pencil necessary. Just picture what's going on. The story is told of D.L. Moody, the great evangelist that founded uh, Moody Bible Institute, one of the schools that I graduated from. The story is told that he went to bed after an evangelistic service one night, and as he climbed in bed, his wife Emma rolled over and she said, well, how did it go tonight, Dwight? And he said, well, pretty good. Two and a half converts. Emma thought for a second. She says, that's, that's a very cute way to put it, Dwight. How old was the child? He said, no, 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 Emma. It was two children and one adult. The children have their whole lives in front of them. It's the adult who's half gone. D.L. Moody led a million people to Christ during his time. Half of them were children. And on his deathbed, he said, if I had my life to live over again, I would dedicate it entirely in ministry to children. In the 1800s, D.L. Moody would have been way out of step with the missiologists and the theologians of his day. And the tragedy is he would still be out of step with the priorities of much of the church in this day. But he understood this harvest. So in my book, Too Small to Ignore, uh, I've made the case that uh, often children's ministry is the great omission in the great commission. And I often have people go, I don't know, that seems a little strong, isn't it? And I think back to where that thought hit me. And that's when I was first becoming president of Compassion. And I went to an evangelism conference that was held for world-class evangelists from all across the world. And being new in the role of president, I wanted to know what could Compassion do to bring this world to Christ? What was our part in all of this? So this was a two and a half day conference in Colorado Springs, our headquarters city. And, uh, and I went there with pat in pan, hand to learn whatever I could glean for compassion to play its part in bringing this world to Christ. So they had it organized that every evangelist, and these were the who's who of evangelists across the world, uh, had 15 minutes. They didn't want jokes. They didn't want stories. They just wanted st statistics. They wanted the most important stuff. A person sat in the front row with a stopwatch, and after 15 minutes, uh, the, you were done with your talk. They, they, they uh, rang the bell, and off you went. It didn't matter if you were Billy Graham. You had 15 minutes to make your case. So I sat there very eager to learn and to see how could I lead compassion in this. And I sat there, and I listened to the first report, and I hadn't written anything down. They didn't say anything about children. So I listened more carefully to the second report. Uh, still nothing. I was beginning to get a little anxious. Nothing in the third. Nothing in the fourth. I was about to start just filling in the O's in the program. You remember how we used to do that in church when we were all bored? I thought, but no, I got, I'm the president of Compassion. I should do something a little more noble than that. So I thought, well, I'm just going to keep track then. How often do they even say child or children? And guys, I sat there for two and a half days and I heard the word child or children only 12 times in two and a half days among these world-class evangelists. And usually it was in passing, like every man, woman, and child. And a, and a woman got up and said, we got to get the women of the world to stop praying for their children and start praying for the world. And I'm like, I totally disagree. But um, she said children, so I got to mark <laughs> that one down. And it got to be very sad, sad research. I looked ahead in the program as my heart grew more and more frustrated. And I saw that there was an other comment section at the end of the conference. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to bide my time. But boy, when we get to that section, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to give them both barrels. But of course, as all conferences happen, uh, even with a bell ring, and they got behind schedule and they had to cancel that last session. And I never got the chance, so it has been burning in my soul all this time. I wanted to jump up and say, people, would you humor me for a second? This sea of humanity that we want to bring to Christ. Who are these people? What do they look like? Picture them in your minds. Now, if every other person in your mental picture isn't a child, you don't even know what the harvest looks like. 
because the world is half children. D.L. Moody understood the importance of that. So they were all into people groups. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I could have learned in those two and a half days how to lead a one-armed Muslim woman cab driver in Islamabad to Christ, but not how to lead a child to Christ. Here they are, half of our world, and as D.O. Moody knew, at the prime time to be brought. Missiologists now tell us that as many as 85% of us who give our lives to Christ do it while we are children between the ages of four and 14, line up 10 Christians and ask them, when did you make that decision? Eight of them will say, uh, well, when I was between four and 14. So let's do a little bit of deep theological research here. How many of you would say, yep, that's the window when I gave my heart to Christ? Raise your hand really high. Yeah, it holds up here. It holds up all across the world. If you don't give your life to Christ by age 20, the probability that you ever will is only a 6% probability. So how many of you did that? After 20, raise your hands high. You guys should go straight out and buy a lottery ticket or something because you beat the odds. Because of that statistic, it's a tragedy that less than 10% of mission organizations' budget is spent on reaching and discipling children. And you guys are a rare church. I've done a walk across this campus you are a rare church, but it is a very rare church that spends more than 15% of its budget on reaching children. I don't know about you, I'm not a rocket scientist, but we are not going to bring in the harvest if we don't have a paradigm shift. And if we miss this harvest, we miss the very heart of God. So I've asked myself, how could this be something so obvious uh, that we're missing it? And I thought, well, maybe it's because there's just too few of them. But I'm like, no, they're, they're half the world. Uh, could it be they're unimportant? Or maybe only half as important as we are because they're only half our size. My five-foot wife can make an eloquent case why size has nothing to do with importance. And I say, yes, ma'am. You're absolutely right, ma'am. I wonder if maybe it's all too complicated. We just are unfamiliar with their plight. What's going on? More of us need to get PhDs in this complicated field. But let me do another little piece of research. Uh, how many of you have ever been a child? <laughs> yeah. Everybody in the room is an expert. You all deserve honorary doctorates. You've done 18 years of field research in this very complicated field. That's 9,500,000 minutes you spent doing nothing but being a child. So it's not like we need to know anything more. I wondered, is God maybe vague about how strategically important they are? But you got the mandate, let the children come, uh, train up a child in a way he should go. Don't you dare cause one of these little ones to stumble. Uh, no, God's made his mind very clear. I've wondered if the scriptures are maybe a little bit vague about their, their importance. But when I go through the scriptures, uh, whenever you see a child in there, and I've done this, uh, almost always God is up to something pretty important. Probably something too important to address to, to a, to a grown-up. It's like he says, wow, this is huge, and I need someone really small. The problem with us grown-ups is we know too much, or we, we think too much, and probably the biggest mistake is we think we know too much. In chapter 8 of Too Small to Ignore, I list all the children and how God uses them, loves them, respects them. Like to kill a giant when military might isn't what was necessary, but faith, the kind of faith that only a little boy would have. Or when a high priest was so far from God that God couldn't even talk to him and chose a little boy named Samuel to speak to Eli, a very strong, harsh message that Jesus taught in the temple when he was 12 years old, that Jesus waited to feed 5,000 people until a little boy came forward and said what only a little boy would say. Jesus, if I gave you everything I have, would that be enough? And we don't even know that little boy's name. The scriptures are abundantly clear um, that children matter to our Heavenly Father. So I began to dig further. Uh, could it be that they are forgotten? Could it be that they are left behind because they're easy to overlook? They're easy to ignore? They are powerless. Think about it. They lack resources. They have no voice. They have no political understanding. They're completely unorganized. 
I mean, just look at their rooms. You know they're completely unorganized. Every segment of society has learned how to champion its cause except children. Have you ever seen a children's protest march? No, I haven't either. But if they could speak for themselves and find their voice, they would have something to say about society because they pay the greatest price when anything goes wrong in society. It spirals downward, starvation, war, uh, natural disasters, always children pay the greatest price. Our sins of commission, doing the things that we know we shouldn't do, children pay the greatest price for those. Prostitution, war, more children killed in the last 10 years, wars, than soldiers, pornography at its worst, slavery, which there are still 27 million slaves in our world, most of them children in the sex trafficking industry. Used to be that slavery, as horrible as it was, was how big is the guy and how much work can he do? Now the question is, how small is she and what can we get away with? Hell does not burn hot enough for that. Our sins of omission, not doing the things that we know we should, our unhappy homes, our missed hugs, our lack of encouragement to the little ones, our lack of prayer time with them, they take it and they bear those burdens themselves. Maybe the worst of all omissions is realizing that this evil is going on in the world and not doing anything about it. It's been said all that's necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. And Einstein said, the world's a dangerous place to live, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who don't do anything about it. So why are children unimportant? Why are they overlooked? After 45 years of ministry to children and eight years of being one, I've discovered this is the case. Although governments and missions and churches often ignore them, there are unseen forces that do not ignore them. The two most powerful forces in all of the universe, the hosts of hell and the hosts of heaven, are watching attentively over each and every child. Satan looking for ways to destroy the lives of little children. And all of heaven stands and rejoices when one little one walks in. And this battle rages over our heads, over each and every child. Satan knows the heart of God, and he is in business to break God's heart. And so the neglect and the abuse and the destruction of children, Satan absolutely delights in that. He watches each child being knit in their mama's womb, according to Psalm 139, verse 13. Each one a miracle, God knowing their hair, their fingerprints, their DNA, their talents, their potential. When every child is born, God sits back just like he did at creation and says, oh, that's good. That is really, really good. So Satan attacks early. He tries to snuff out these little ones before they can be born. That's why the womb has become the most dangerous place on earth to be a child, either because of poverty or ironically, because of comfort. Satan will use either one of those to separate us from God. That's why compassion works with each individual child, and we do it through the local church. The worst thing about poverty is it says to a little child, you don't matter, nobody cares about you, nothing's ever going to change for you, don't you dare hope. And the church comes along with a gospel that says, that's a complete lie. God knows you. He loves you. He would have died on the cross if he were the only child on earth. Don't you dare give up on yourself. And so compassion works only to bless children through the little local church. And you, sponsors, join that little local church to help disciple this child. When you write letters that say, I care, I'm looking at the pictures you send, I'm reading the letters, I'm proud of you, I, can, I believe in you. So I've never met a champion for children who didn't have a pretty powerful reason for why they do. And in the moments left, I want to share with you quickly, why on earth would I give 45 years of my life? Why would I have retired really eight years ago and I'm not playing golf and I rarely fish? Uh, it's because this cause is hugely important to me. And it launched when I, a long, long time ago uh, when I was being knit in my mama's womb. I'm sure the angels were giving God all kinds of advice on how to do this. Uh, and when I was born, there must have been quite a bit of disappointment because they said, you know, he's cute as a button, isn't he? But he's not a rocket scientist. We're going to have to make it really clear what he's to do with his life. 
So I got born into a missionary family, Ken and Marge Stafford, out of Denver, Colorado. And we were assigned the most remote, hot, desert outpost uh, in all of Africa. I was a typical missionary child, uh, ran around barefoot, spoke four languages every day, but none of them very well, slingshot around my neck, skinny as a rail, sickly much of the time, almost died uh, six times of my childhood. My sister and I were the only white children for 100 miles, and 100 miles on a dirt little road is all day's drive uh, to the nearest hospital. Uh, typical day was 120 degrees. Uh, it was remote, like I said, no electricity, no television, no radio, no refrigerator. My mom, the city girl from Denver, uh, I remember so clearly she would stand at the sink with her little Tupperware bowl, sweat dripping off her beautiful little nose. She was a lovely lady. She would wash dishes watching the shimmering heat off the Sahara Desert, and she would say, you know, I didn't get much luxury in life after all, but I do have this way out here. I have running water. Wes, grab a bale and go out to the, to the well. So I, I was the running water, back and forth to the house for my beautiful mother. My father was a linguist. He put the Senefu language into writing, translated scripture. At age seven, I was teaching Africans how to read. We opened villages to the gospel where no white people had been since the slave traders. I can remember clearly. They had a saying in our little village, it takes the whole village to raise a child. This was not a plaque on the wall. This is how the village lived. Every child belonged to every grown-up. And I was the wrong color, mind you, but it didn't matter. Uh, and I was raised like one of the village children. I never fell down without some African woman swooping in, picking me up, drying my tears and sending me on my way. I didn't get away with a lot of mischief because uh, I kind of stood out with his white skin. <laughs> I remember the, the one time when village was gathered around the campfire because we had no television. That's how we entertained ourselves. And the chief was giving the evening news and he says, I'm noticing that the ghosts are kind of skinny this year and it's not because we're in a drought. It's because the little boys of the village are chasing them all around. And in the swirling red dust, I don't know who all the culprits are, but I do know this. The little white boy right there. He's one of them right there. And I used to pray every night, dear Lord, please. I know you can do this. You brought down the walls of Jericho. You parted the Red Sea. When I wake up in the morning, let my skin be black like all of my friends. And that would be the first thing I would check every morning. I'd throw off the sheet. Gah, still white. But maybe tomorrow. Maybe it takes time. They taught me what they taught their children. I learned how to hunt. I learned how to fish. I learned how to farm. By the time I was 15 years old and came to America, I was a fully trained peasant farmer who could have raised a family on that desert. But more important than those skills, they taught me my values. They built my character. They shaped my heart. The poor taught me about love and joy and hope and time and gratitude and strength and generosity and courage. Everything I ever needed to know to lead Compassion's worldwide ministry, I learned from the poor in that tiny little village. But we were poor, and there was no escaping that. Everything had to work. Uh, we had to be able to get animals. We had to be able to catch fish. Uh, the rain had to fall, and we were very vulnerable. We walked the tightrope of survival. I remember one year when a, a swarm of locusts came off the Sahara Desert, and the sky was black with grasshoppers. It must have been like Egypt. And they were on the ground in our village for about two hours. We ran out and tried to scare them off. And when they left after two hours, they took everything green with them. Our corn crops were gone. The mango trees were stripped bare. The migrating animals went on looking for grass elsewhere. The swamp dried up. For a year, my family and uh, the village did nothing but eat bugs. You look at pictures of me that year. I look like skin and bones. The next year, an epidemic of measles came through our village, and because we were already weak, uh, it was a killer. And in the span of two weeks, one out of every four of my childhood friends died of measles, many of them right in my arms as I pleaded with God to spare their lives. I finally ran to my father as he was translating, and I said, Daddy, when do you think it'll be my turn? And he said, your turn for what, Wes? And I said, to die, Daddy. All my friends are dying, and I think I'm 
probably going to die soon too. Do you know when? I'll never forget this. I've written a book called Just a Minute, that if God gives you one minute with a child, you might be the one who says the right thing, does the right thing. And this was the one minute with me because my father said to me, put down the Bible, looked at me and he said, Wes, you don't have to worry about this. He said, roll up your t-shirt. He said, those little scratches on your arm, those are called vaccination. You got that in America before you came here so that this wouldn't happen to you. And I will never forget that moment because I became at age about six Compassion's president, clearly in my mind. My, my father's face went blurry through my tears and I stammered, Papa, that's not fair. Why do I have scratches on my arm and none of my friends do? And it was my first realization that the world is not fair. And I landed somehow on the blessed side of this. And, I, I, and it, it, it broke, broke my heart. By the time I was 15 years old and left the village, half of all of my boyhood friends had died. I know the statistics, but I know their names. I know what they wanted to be, what they hoped to become. We buried them the same day they died. We had no choice. And I cried myself to sleep hundreds and hundreds of nights over the loss of my little friends. Finally, at age 15, I come to America. The first place I see in America is New York City, Manhattan. You talk about a a desert village to Manhattan. What a culture shock that was. I remember watching people with big paper bags walking around and being a pretty darn good hunter. I tracked them down. Where's that coming from? And it came to my first grocery store and I saw all this food and I realized there's plenty of food. And next door was a pharmacy. And I said in my broken English, what all this? And the guy said, well, it's all medicine. I said, you have vaccination? He says, oh, yeah, and the freezer's out back. We don't sell it to little guys like you. And suddenly I had this epiphany. There's plenty of food and there's plenty of medicine. It didn't need to happen. None of my little buddies needed to die. And I went out front of that store and I sat down and I just wept and I wept and I wept. It was New York City, so nobody even stopped and said, are you okay, little guy? I ran out of tears after a couple hours. Now I'm watching them walk by. And I'm seeing these fancy shoes, these fancy purses, and I'm like, what is wrong with you people? You have all this, and you don't care. And I went into a rage that lasted all through my high school years in America till I had lived here for about eight years. And suddenly I realized, you're wrong, Wes. It's they don't care. It's not that they don't care. They don't know. And when they know, they really, really care. There's never been a more generous nation than the United States. So I thought somehow I've got to become a bridge between these two worlds because I know the poor, but now I know these people too. And somehow they need each other. How does this happen? And I thought, oh no, I've got to become an ambassador or something like that when I stumbled into this little church or this storefront store in Chicago and it was called Compassion International. And I said, what do you do? And they said, well, our enemy is poverty. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. And I said, what do you do about it? They said, we bring people together. We take these little children, their family, a little local church, and people in America who who, who may have some money in their pocket, but they need love and hope and joy that these people have. We need to bring them together. That's what we do. We call it sponsorship. And I said, you know what? This is a great relief. I don't have to go out and start an organization. I'm just going to throw my hat in the ring and help this place be as good as it can be and as big as it can be. And so that was 45 years ago that I did that, and I have not looked back. I've watched the organization grow. As uh, Pastor Dave said, now 2.2 million, 8,000 churches in 25 countries. I can tell you with absolute certainty, and I know this matters to you, that 500 children will accept Jesus Christ as their Savior today in the ministry of compassion among those 2 million children at the knee of their pastor or at a Sunday school class somewhere. Think about it. It would take only a week for compassion to fill every seat in this place about three times over with children giving their life to Christ. Now the job for the church and for you as as sponsors is to disciple them into their God-given potential. So now you know my battle. Now you know why I'm not playing golf. Now you know why I still stay engaged in all of this. And the question I have for you is, so what is your cause? Everybody needs a cause. Everybody needs something that can move you to tears in 30 seconds, either tears of great sorrow at the need or tears of great joy 
act of victories. And if you don't have a cause like that, my prayer is please don't live like that. We don't have time for you to live stuck in second gear. It doesn't have to be my cause, but choose something that is worthy of your time and your treasure, something worthy of your heart. And if you don't have one, I got an idea. Take mine. Join me in the battle for the children. And so my prayer for you, dear, dear church, is the same as the prayer I have for myself, that you will find your cause, that you will throw yourself into it with everything that you have. In the midst of that hug, in the midst of that letter sent across the world, in the midst of that meal being served, in the midst of that prayer, suddenly, in a moment, when you least expect it, a trumpet blast, and you will look up, we all will look up, and the sky will roll back like a scroll, and we will go home, home. Home where there's no more hunger, home where there's no more sickness, home where there's no more death. In fact, home where there aren't even any tears. Because in Revelation 21, verse 4, God says, I, I myself, your Father, I will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Think about it, guys. The hands that knit you in your mama's womb are waiting for you to wipe the tears from your eyes, having felt everything you've felt. The hands that picked you up when you fell down and just didn't feel like you could go on, those hands are waiting to... Wipe the tears from your eyes. The hands that took those nails on the cross to redeem you are waiting for you, waiting to wipe the tears from your eyes. And I don't know about you, but I cannot wait for that day. I cannot wait to run. I mean run, not walk. Into the arms of my Lord, my Savior, my Jesus, my King, my Redeemer. And I can't wait for him as I'm panting in his arms to wipe the tears from my eyes. Way too many tears for one lifetime. But oh, Avenue, my prayer for you is the same as my prayer for myself. And that as he wipes the tears from my eyes, he notices he also needs to wipe the sweat from my brow. Because I live the life that he called me to live. I fought for justice. I was kind to the poor. I spoke up for those who couldn't speak for themselves until I was suddenly and wonderfully, and you, interrupted by heaven. Oh, may that be true for you, and may that be true for me. And I pray this with all my heart, in Jesus' name, amen. About 10 years ago, I went down to Guatemala with compassion because the Avenue strives to partner with people who are already doing ministry instead of coming up with our own ministries to do everything God wants us to do. So compassion caught my attention and I went to Guatemala and I met a six-year-old girl named Demarius. They brought her and her mother to me and I bought her a little doll and I handed her that doll. And her mother, with tears in her eyes, told the interpreter, this is the first gift Demarius has ever received in her six years of life. I started sponsoring her that day. She's 15 years old now, and I get letters from her, and I write letters to her. And I've seen her in Guatemala twice since then. And I've been an incredible part of her life, and she's been a part of mine. About three years ago, we did an audit with Compassion and I went down and I took a list of names that our church people had because, you know, I'm the pastor. They're going to make sure that, you know, I have a kid and it's a good experience, right? So I took random names and random numbers and I went down to Guatemala and I would go into the church and I would say, I'd like to see this child. His name is, here's his number. And then they went and they pulled that exact child out of that class and I took a picture and sent it back to their sponsors. I want you to know when you sponsor one of these children, you are sponsoring this child. Now, while I was there, our church contact, his name is Paul, sent a little five-year-old out to hug my wife. And then he looked at me and goes, he doesn't have a sponsor. 
So now we have Milo, is also one of our compassion children. And he's only about nine right now, but we got him at five years old. And he's just as sweet as he can be. And I want you to know, it's, it's real. You get to impact, and compassion has more integrity and vision. And you know, I didn't go on a fishing trip. I went to meet, I went to meet Wes, because that's the kind of vision and passion that we want to partner with. And so it's time for you to decide whether you need to partner or not. Those Unanis here, if you're on the front porch, this is time for you to decide. We don't use guilt. We don't use manipulation. That's not who we are. But if the Holy Spirit of God is whispering to you that just for 38 or $39 a month, you can change a child's life, then I have 100 names here in the front of the church. There's names in front of Ennis, and there's tables set up in the back. Just come up. If you have a child, let them pick the child and let them be part of that ministry. And I tell you, you will be blessed. And if you want, you can have the opportunity to go to Guatemala or Honduras and actually see this child and meet this child. It is a great privilege. I'm so proud to be part of the Compassion family. And I hope you'll become part of the Compassion family too. So I'm going to have you stand. As you stand, I want to pray over you and I want you to ask God, is this partnership for me? If it's not, that's okay. But if it is, I'm going to invite you to come and find one of these names. Uh, you can fill it out here, or there's a QR code. Uh, Paul and Wes will be in the back for you if you want to ask questions. And then there's tables set up back there for those of you that are too scared to come to the front. So we got you covered. Father God, I come before you today, and I thank you for the privilege of being part of the Compassion family. God, as 2.2 million children around this world are fed, are educated, are loved, and led to meet you as their Savior. Thank you for the avenue and the generosity that they have. Thank you, God, that we know these children will not be without a sponsor much longer because of the hearts and the love of our people. In Jesus' name. Our band's going to play. You come on up. You can fill the cards out here, or you can do the QR code on the back. So I invite you up now. And those of the rest of you, if you want to go through the back, uh, there's also places in the back. Mother's Day's next week. Do not forget it, guys. We'll see you next week. Look forward to it. See you then. Thank you for being so generous.
Started. 